for love like yours. We're so thankful tonight that we can lean into you, lean into your love, lean into your heart, that you have all that we need. That when we feel alone, God, when we feel like nobody else might know what we feel like, that we're experiencing or what we walk through or what we're carrying, you do. That you meet us where we are. We don't have to figure it out before we get to you. Thank you. We don't have to be good enough, Lord. You call us enough. Jesus, we're grateful for your love. We're grateful for your grace and your mercy and your healing in this place. Would you continue to have your way in here tonight, God? Just move through your word. Touch hearts, change lives, transform us from the inside out, Holy Spirit. We pray this all in your mighty name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Take a moment to say hi to somebody before you take your seat. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. All right, why don't you guys go ahead, finish up your greetings real quick, go ahead and take a seat. Man, it's bright up here and dark out there. I'm just going to assume there's people out there looking at me. Hi, everyone. How are we doing? Good? Awesome. Well, hey, uh, I, there's a bunch of you here that I don't know. My name is Marcus. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I get the... Amazing uh, privilege to work with junior high, high school, young adult group, and uh, love being at YA from time to time. Um, and tonight we get uh, to do something really special here. There's been, uh, everyone ever heard of you know, what's been going on the past two years? You know, how, like you couldn't travel and couldn't do all that kind of stuff. Well, our church uh, has not been able to send people overseas for the past two years. And this year, we get to send some teams out. And the first team that's going out is actually our YA Thailand team. So I'm going to call them up in just a second, just a second, because there's uh, amazing news that they're going. But you're going to notice that there's a person that's not up there with them, and that's Pastor Bray Lynn. Uh, because unfortunately, Pastor Bray Lynn tested positive for COVID this morning. So um, what we're going to do, we're going to pray twice, okay? We're going to pray one, uh, because currently Braylon is not going to be going to Thailand with them. But we have seen God move on behalf of this team in really amazing ways over the past week. You guys raised like $11,000 in like 10 days, right? Or something like that. Like crazy. Like that's insane. So there's been miraculous stuff. God's God's already moved in miraculous ways for them. And we're just going to believe we're going to believe and pray that Braylon's going to wake up tomorrow with no symptoms, get a negative test, and we get to send her to, to Thailand. <laughs> and not to be, because currently, obviously, she's not going, but, and not to be reckless or to be dangerous or anything, that's obviously why she's not currently going, but we believe in a God of miracles, right? We believe in a God that does supernatural things, and, um, and we're going to believe for that for Braylon. So we're going to pray for Braylon, and I'm going to call these guys up to the front. And because of what I currently just talked about, COVID, the big fun word that we've been talking about for two years, we're not going to have everyone come up here because we want to send the rest of the team. So we're going to have you stay in your seats, extend a hand. Um, but let's just lift up our pastor. Can we lift up Braylon right now? Can we just believe for her, pray for her, and contend for her? Let's do that. Jesus, we, um, we just believe, um, Lord, that you are able. You are, you are able to do... Um, immeasurably more than we could ever ask or think. So Jesus, we just pray that over Braylon, over her heart, over her, um, her physical condition right now. Jesus, we pray for symptoms to be gone in the name of Jesus. We pray for positive tests to be gone in the name of Jesus, but Lord, for a negative test over the next day, two days, Lord, that we'd be able to send her to Thailand for the things she's been praying for, believing for, contending and leading for for the past few months, Jesus. Um, and Lord, ultimately, we trust you 
we've, we've trusted you till now, and we'll trust you till forever. So God, we thank you for your perfect will, that it guides us, that it leads us, that we can lean on you, trust in you, God, and that you have seen this team going to Thailand and the way that it's going to go from the very beginning. God, that you are ahead of us. You have been mapping this out from the very beginning, and we trust you, Jesus, but we also believe that you can, um, God, move miraculously on behalf of Braylon, on behalf of this team. So Jesus, would you come and do that? Um, we just lift her up to you, Lord. Pray your comfort over her, your joy, your peace over her, Jesus. Um, just know the heartbreak that she's been experiencing today. And Lord, we pray that you would be near. We know that you are, and we pray that she would feel that tangibly. She'd experience your spirit in a tangible and tangible way. Lord, we thank you for our sister. We thank you for our pastor, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, let's have the Thailand team come on up to the front. We're going to pray for them now. Come on up. You guys don't have to be shy. You're going to Thailand. You can come on up. It's you. We're talking about you. Let's give it up for them, ladies and gentlemen. File in. And we're going to, like I said, we're just going to extend a hand and pray and believe for them. They got a lot of travel ahead of them. They have a lot of ministry ahead of them. They have a lot of, um, you know, early mornings and late nights and all the good stuff. I was telling them before earlier, this summer, I mean, if you guys didn't get to go on a trip this year, uh, if you've been praying about it or thinking about it, there's nothing better you can do with your time. You, nothing, no better two weeks you can spend than going overseas and seeing what the Lord is doing in a country, in a culture that is so far different from yours and see God move in really miraculous ways. And they get to do that over the next couple of weeks. So why don't you guys just extend a hand out and we're going to pray just a blessing and a covering over them. Um, and Jesus, we just come into agreement with that. Lord, we, we come into agreement with no more positive tests, God, with no more symptoms, Jesus, that you would cover this team. Um, Lord, that you uh, would use this team to spread your love, to um, love people well, to learn about a different culture than theirs. And Lord, to not just come and project the American way, but Lord, to come in to learn how the church in Thailand is, is loving uh, the people that you love, Jesus. To come and be the body of Christ, to serve first, um, to, to lay down their lives before you, God, and to say yes and amen to what you have over them. So, God, we pray for traveling mercy. We pray for physical health. We pray for unity, unity, unity in the name of Jesus. God, we pray for no gossip. We pray for no drama. And we pray where drama may raise its ugly little head, Lord, that there would be a heavenly, loving conflict, a resolution in the name of Jesus, Lord, that they would see unity lived out in their very, in, right in front of their very own eyes, God, and that they would be able to embody um, the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, Jesus, that they would be be a reflection of you, that they would uh, love like you, God, and that's to lay down their life for the benefit of their brother and sister, Jesus. So would you use them to be a blessing? Um, would you leverage their lives for more than uh, what they've seen before, God? Would they just be able to see you move in their life in a way that ne they've never seen before, Jesus? Um, would you come and do what it is that you want to do? Um, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray, uh, pray all that in Jesus' matchless name. Everyone said, amen, amen. <laughs> Well, why don't you guys continue to be praying for them over the next couple of weeks? They'll be coming back when? July 6th. See, I'm, I know so much. <laughs> July 6th. They're coming back July 6th. So be praying for them. Wake up in the morning. Pray for them. Before you go to, night, before you go to bed, pray for them. As you think about them, pray for them. Um, but we love them, and we're believing for an awesome two weeks. Can you guys give it up for them one more time? Awesome. Well, We're going to uh, jump to the, the message portion of the night right now. So I know you just said hi to somebody, but say hi to somebody else as the video plays. Greet somebody else around you. Do that. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Noah, for all the excitement in the front row. I actually really do appreciate that. Um, can we give it up for worship real quick? They did an awesome job. Can we just give it up for them again? Mm. Such an awesome job, and I'm struggling right now with my pastor. Do you ever just randomly forget your pastor for a second? It's the worst thing in the world. Um, hey, guys, um, if you guys don't know me, my name is Nate. Um, I am on staff here at Water of Life. I serve or I work over on the Upland campus and I do the students' ministries over there 
And it really has been um, a pleasure, and it's been a stretching moment, and it's been a growing moment, and I really, really enjoy it. And, you know, shameless plug, if you guys just feel called to serve junior high, high school in the Upland area specifically, come talk to me after the message. I just love to get to talk to you and get to know you and honestly just hear your story. Um, another thing, a buddy of my mind, Adrian, um, there's two Adrians, you're going to come up soon, but not yet, um, but my buddy Adrian, I haven't seen him in a hot minute, and I just want him to know that I am super happy to see you, bro, I've been praying for you, and I'm just super glad to see you, but my other friend Adrian over here, actually, I'm going to invite him up, um, we're just praying for a lot of people today, so my buddy Adrian here, who I've been getting to know I don't know, a couple months now, more intentionally, um, decided that he didn't really like hanging out with me. So he's moving to South Carolina, actually. Um, he's over there going to take on a job opportunity, correct? And, you know, it's something he's been praying about, and he really feels God's calling to move to South Carolina. And just like what we want to do with the Thailand team, we want to send him off with a blessing. We want to send him with a prayer. And just like Thailand, um, you can extend your hand, but don't come up. Um, we want to make sure everyone is COVID-free. Um, we want to end this thing as quickly as possible. But, yeah, man, we're super excited for you. We're super sad that you're leaving, and we're going to miss you. But, hey, technology is great, so you will be getting texts and FaceTimes and phone calls, I'm sure, from a plethora of people. So we are going to pray him out. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we just we thank you for Adrian's life. We just thank you for the presence he brought here at YA. And it's just a presence that always has a smile on him, that's always laughing, Lord. And we just thank you for that. And Holy Spirit, I know you wanted to know that he did have an impact on this community. He had an impact on people's lives, on my life, Lord. And we just thank you for the time that we did get to have him here at YA. And as he transitions to this new job, to across the country, Lord, we just pray that he'd go in your favor and in your blessing, Lord that you would bless the travel there, that you would bless his hands with the work, Lord, and that you would just bless his living situation. We ask that he would find favor in your eyes and amongst men, and that when he goes out there, he would also find a community and a people to love on him and pour into him and encourage him, Lord. And we also just pray that we would stay connected with him, Lord. God, you, heard, you don't call someone to move across the country unless you're doing something really, really wild and I'm excited to hear this journey unfold, and I pray that when things get hard and when things get tough, that Adrian remember it was you that called him, and it was you, it is you that will sustain him and move him through it, God. Father, we love Adrian, you love Adrian, and we are excited to see his new journey, but we're also sad to see him leave. Pray all this in your name, amen. See you, bro. Here you go. <laughs> All right, now um, now that we've got all those prayers done and we've blessed people on their way out, um, we're going to get into this message. Now, if you guys know, we're in a series called My Home, My People. Or is it the other way around? My People? Oh, it's just My People. I should know that. Anyways, yeah, we're in a series called My People. It's a series surrounding community. And this is our fourth week. You know, in week one, Braylon came and she talked a lot about solitude. She talked about how your journey into community starts with your solitude time with God. How you relate to God, how you do life with God is how you're going to do life with people and with community. So she really presses to have that time of solitude so that we can just get our hearts right with God, but also have his heart when we go into community. The next week I came and I talked about how community is a risk. You know, it's it's a risk to go into community because, you know, Mark has kind of talked to it about the Thailand team. There can be drama. There can be gossip. There's broken people. There's hurt people who are going to break and hurt other people. But it's a risk that God calls us to because it is life-giving. We are designed for community. We are created for it. We are made to do life with other people. So it's a risk that we must take. And then last week, Braylon came back, and she talked about vulnerability, you know, that really fun thing that we all love to do, to be vulnerable, to open ourselves to people, to allow people to see our messiness and to see the baggage and hurt that we hold. And she talked about how if you're going to do real community, if you're going to do a community that is actually impactful to you and to the people around you, you have to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to share things about yourself. You have to be willing to open up. And then you also have to be willing to hear people. 
And, you know, as I was thinking about these three things, you know, the worship song, um, you know, God doesn't give his heart in pieces. It really struck me because God does the same thing with us. You see, as we know, God is this everlasting God. He's existed for eternity before we were created. And during that time, in the time of his solitude, in the time when it was just him, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, he decided to take a risk and create people. He decided to create people and make himself known to them. Like God himself exercised this solitude, this risk, and this vulnerability with us. You know, he makes us to completely know him, but he also makes us to be able to deny him. And when you see the scriptures, you can see that he gets grieved and he gets hurt. Like he gets, he mourns over his creation at times. And like what we've been talking about these three weeks, like Holy Spirit really just spoke to me during worship that that is what he's been doing with us since the beginning. He's been willing to take that risk and he's been willing to be vulnerable with us. You know, all of these things build on each other. They're like interdependent, they're interwoven. And when we go into this week, you know, if we're talking about vulnerability, what that means is if there's vulnerability, there's going to be rejection. And see, I have that fun topic today of talking about rejection and its many forms, but just how solitude and risk and vulnerability are all a part of community, so is rejection. It's one of those hard truths. It's bittersweet, like, You experience rejection, and it's rough, and it's tough. And, you know, to have like a little working definition as we we continue to discuss this, you know, we're going to define rejection as the intentional or unintentional, or unintentional act of refusing to acknowledge, accept, use, or believe in someone or something. It can be intentional, or it can be unintentional. I'm going to go into that a little bit more lately. Um, later. I said lately. (laughs) But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. If you guys want to turn your Bible, your iPad, your iPhone, whatever, turn it there. And we're going to look at the life of Jesus. Because the life of Jesus shows us, well, a bunch of things, but it shows us how to operate within this life where rejection is inevitable. If you enter into community, if you take the risk, if you be vulnerable, rejection is this inevitable thing that you're going to encounter one day. And Jesus himself encountered this. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. We're going to be in verses 17, and we're going to go all the way through 34. So it's a little bit of a read, but so if you guys are there, I'm going to go ahead and read for us. Um, It says, now the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, "My uh, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your place with the disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. For the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now, if you are paying attention to this passage, Jesus talked about a lot of rejection he's about to experience. Judas is about to betray him. His disciples are going to scatter and run away from him. Peter is going to deny knowing him three times. And I want to paint 
a picture of what's going on in this passage. There's a lot of context, and I want you guys, as you keep some of the things of the passage in mind, I want you to hear this context. So one, what's going on in this context is the Passover. The Passover was the celebration of the Exodus story, the celebration of God leading the people out of Egypt into the promised land via Moses. And during this time, Israel rejected God several times. They're always complaining. They're saying it'd be better if we'd be back in Egypt. The story of the Passover is God's faithfulness despite Israel's constant rejection of him, despite them wanting to go back to their place of slavery versus their place of freedom with God. And when we read this, it calls us to the moment of Jesus. Because Jesus is entering into a moment where he's about to free people from their sin. He's going to be crucified very soon, and he's freeing the humanity from their sin. Jesus, in this sense, is like the new Moses, but better. And Jesus, at this time, has also already experienced rejection, whether it be from the Pharisees or different people in the crowds. He has experienced rejection. And then, like I said, later this night, Jesus is going to be arrested. He alludes to it. He says, hey, someone's going to betray me today. And he, Peter's going to deny him before the rooster crows. Like he knows he's about to be arrested. His friends are going to scatter. And he's, then he's going to be tortured. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be humiliated. And then he's going to be crucified. These are all things Jesus knows. And he knows this knowing that his closest friends are going to betray him. They're going to deny him. They're going to, you know, for 30 pieces of silver, Judas is going to say, hey, this is the guy that you want to crucify. Like, they're going to sell him out. They're going to pretend like they don't even know him. This is all in Jesus' mind right before he says, take this bread and drink this wine with me. You know, back in that day, there is... When it comes to community and when it comes to eating, it's very, very not COVID friendly, actually. Because what they would do is they would have this table that would actually spin. And sometimes they would have different dipping sauces and they would double dip. You would have a bread and you would dip it and then the other person would dip it and you would bite. And it was this showing that, hey, I accept you. You are my people. I love you. I don't care that you have different germs. Like, I'm going to be here with you. This eating with people in someone's home, this dipping of the bread was so significant because you wouldn't do this with anyone. I mean, today you wouldn't really, now because of COVID, you wouldn't do that ever. But even beforehand, like if you think like, oh, I only share this water bottle with someone else. Like I'll tell someone else, hey, you better take a waterfall. But the other person's like, oh, you can drink it. It's fine. Like this is what's going on there, but it's way more significant. It's so significant to the culture that they all partake in this. And it shows that, hey, whoever's around me, those are my people. I do life with them. I don't care what they've done. I don't care who they are. I'm going to do life with them. And Jesus did this with his disciples, the ones who are going to scatter with him. But Judas, the one who's going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. With Peter, who's going to deny him three times. He did this knowingly. You see, Jesus knowingly did life with people who he knew would reject him. That's part of this passage. That's part of what it's explaining to us, what it's portraying to us, that Jesus knew he was going to be rejected, but he did life with them anyways. You see, Jesus hung out with people who would reject him. Jesus had fun with those who would reject him. Jesus would mourn with those who would reject him. He would pray for those. He would serve them. He would love them and accept them knowing, knowing that they were going to reject him. See, Jesus chose community. Jesus chose and chose these people to do life with them, to serve them, to honor them, to say, these are my people, even though they were going to reject him. Which for me is such, such a crazy thought. Like, a lot of us have experienced rejection in community, but we didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know I was going to get rejected. It just happened. And if I'm being honest, if I knew it was going to happen, I wouldn't have done community with that person. I would have walked away really early on. If I had seen the red flag sooner, I would have bounced. I would have left. But Jesus didn't. Jesus and his perfect knowledge say, I'm going to experience this rejection, and I'm going to go through it. You know, and there's so many forms of rejection. I think as I was doing this sermon, I was prepping, God brought to memory this, like my first significant form of rejection. It was back in sixth grade. And you guys, some of you guys remember MySpace? 
Anyone remember MySpace? So MySpace, you could do some crazy things on it. You could put your favorite song, your top friends. You could put little headers in, like, your profile. And I remember there was this girl I knew, and, you know, we were messaging back and forth. And, you know, I kind of liked her. She was really cute. And I remember she, like, messaged me, hey, have you seen my new, like, header? And I was just like, no. She's like, oh, go check it out. So I checked it out, and it said, I like this guy, and I really think he likes me back. And I was like, oh, bro. She's... Like, this is, she's making it so easy for me. Like, I'm so excited. And I remember, like, I was kind of jumping up. I was like, wow, I'm about to get, like, my first girlfriend. It's going to be great. And mind you, I was pretty, like, insecure at the time, too. So I was feeling, I was feeling great. And then she, I was like, oh, I just saw it. That's really cool. And she messaged me back and was like, do you like me? And I was like, yes. And she's like, oh, I don't like you. And I was like, what? (laughs) I was like, I was so hurt because I was just like, you just played with my emotions. Like, you played with my whole life right now. Like, and this is why, like, I'm just saying, like, you ladies aren't as innocent as you make it out to be. Like, y'all play with our emotions, too. Like, I'm a sensitive and emotional guy, and that hurt. Like, like God brought it to memory now, you know? You know, and that's kind of, you know, it's, it's cute. It's funny. It was a little crush. But, you know, there's also, like, a serious relationship. You know, I, I've had serious relationship where I was rejected at the end of it, and it hurts, you know, years. You know, uh, if you know my testimony, I, w- I was married before, and I experienced some severe rejection in that moment, and that hurts. It hurts a lot when you love someone and they said they loved you back. And not that that she didn't love me back, but then there was this moment of rejection that I experienced. You know, I've I've experienced rejection with my family. I remember one time me and my brother arguing about something kind of serious. And I remember I just like poured out to him like in the midst of the argument, like, bro, like this is what I'm dealing with. Like this is what's going on in my heart. Like I'm hurting and I'm confused and I'm lost. And he didn't care didn't even acknowledge it, just brushed on and went to make his next point and to continue to combat me and attack me and say, I'm right, you're wrong. Like, and it was just this moment where my feelings, my hurt, my baggage, like the things I was wrestling with were rejected. Like it's, sometimes it's the things inside of you that rejected, not just you as a person in relationship, but like your feelings, your hurt, your baggage. Like I took a moment to be vulnerable. I took a risk to be vulnerable with my brother, which I'm not accustomed to. Like I'm very walled off with my family like I just that's how I've operated for so long and I took this moment with my brother and didn't even acknowledge it just rejected it you know I've had even weird moments where people rejected me in such an unintentional way while still wanting to love and care for me they rejected me you know I've had meetings that I'm supposed to have with um, with people who are meant to pour into me and care for me and like these meetings just get pushed back and pushed back and canceled and redone and I'm just like do I not matter and I feel rejected. I feel like I'm not valued. I feel like I'm not worth spending time with. I'm not worth being poured into. Now, I've had meetings where we're in the meeting and then they get called out because in my mind, something more important came up and they had to go deal with it. And I just remember sitting there in, these, in that meeting when that happened, like, God, what is this? Like, I was really excited for this but I, because I needed it. And this person is meant to like, care for me and pour into me. And yet they're elsewhere. It's a one-hour meeting, and they were gone for 45 minutes. <laughs> and they have a meeting right after me, and, I'm, and I just felt so rejected. And I felt so hurt. I felt like my time, my personhood wasn't valuable. There's so many forms. I know there's other forms that you can take. I know some of you have shared dreams and hopes and aspirations with family members, and they've looked at you and said, that's a really fun dream, but you need an actual job. And even when you try to pour into them and say, no, this is my heart with it, they say, no, 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 you need an actual job. Like, that's fun to do on the side, but you you need to grow up. And they reject your dreams, your thoughts, your ideas. You know, maybe you and your friends are talking about a subject and you say something and they just dismiss it like, nah, bro, that's dumb. Like, why are you even talking? Like, clearly, you don't know what you're saying and they dismiss you. That is also rejection. There's romantic rejection like I've talked about, but there's also platonic rejection. You know, you try to make friends with someone or whatever because maybe you think they're interesting or cool and then they just don't, are not sharing the same interest and you realize, oh, like, you don't want to hang out with me. Like, I see why you're being short, you know? When they start texting the UK, uh-huh, yep. Like, that's a sign, stop texting them. Like, it's going nowhere, I'm sorry, but that's what it is. Some of us have been just rejected by people in a variety of ways and it hurts. And, you know, some of us have been rejecting ourselves, You reject yourself. You minimize your own hurt. 
You say, my hurt and my burdens aren't as bad as the person I know, so I'm not even going to deal with them. I'm not going to share them with people. I'm just going to push that to the side. You push that part of you to the side, and you reject yourself. You say, I'm not valuable. I don't have worth. I'm not worth being known. I'm not worth being someone's friend. Like, I'm just going to stay in the back. And you reject that intrinsic value you have in being God's child. Like, you can reject yourself. And for me, that's some of, that's like the worst rejection when you reject yourself. Because, you know, I can be rejected by people and, you know, I can do two things. I can villainize them. I can be like, oh, that's just a terrible person anyways. And they're awful. Like, why would I even want to be accepted by them? And then I can also really victimize them and be like, you know what? They're just so broken and hurt. I understand why they rejected me. You know, I can go numb to it. But when you reject yourself, when you're saying I'm not worthy, I don't have value. I shouldn't, I don't deserve to have friends. Why would anyone want to get to know me? Like, that's something you can't do because you can't victimize yourself and you won't villainize yourself. You'll just sit knowing that you don't accept your own self. And then, you know, I, I know this is resonating with some of you. It resonates with me. But then there's also the real fact that a lot of us have rejected others. The way you feel you've done that to someone else. And that's why I said earlier, a lot of these things are unintentional. Yes, some people will reject you intentionally. That girl in sixth grade rejected me intentionally. She did it systematically. Like, she wanted to tell me no. Like, it was terrible. But but most of the time, 95% of the time, it's unintentional. My brother didn't know that he was rejecting me. He was just broken and hurt and angry in that time. You know, that serious ex of mine, she was broken and hurt, and she was just trying to survive herself. Yes, she rejected me, but she was hurt too. All those meetings that I've had pushed back, like it's not those people didn't care about me, but there are responsibilities, there are obligations. And, you know, that meeting that I was waiting for 45 minutes, you know, he came back and was just so apologetic and was making sure to know, like, hey, this wasn't intentional. I didn't mean to do this. Like, most of the time, it really is unintentional. Like, I've rejected people intentionally and unintentionally, you know, I have this, I knew this guy when I was working at Target, and his name, we call him Brendo, really cool dude. Now, granted, I was going through some tough things during that time. It was the time where my previous marriage was really hard and chaotic, and I remember him and me, we're talking, and this guy's so cool. I like this guy. He's really dope. He's like, hey, man, like, you know, you, you're young. I'm young. We're both in serious relationships. Like, we should go on a double date sometime, and I remember in my head, like, I don't know if we're ever going to get that chance, like, so I tell him, I'm like, hey, man, uh, yeah, maybe we'll see. You know, life's really busy, and I didn't think much of it, but when I played that moment back in my head, like, an hour later, I was like, I remembered his face, and I can tell, like, oh, this guy doesn't think I like him. And to this day, like, I never got that chance to, like, clarify that, like, hey, man, I was just going through some things. Like, I hope to God, like, I prayed to God literally that I meet him again because I don't work there anymore, that we could just hang out. We could go on a double date with my new girlfriend. Like, he's such a great guy, but, like, I unintentionally rejected him. But, you know, if you were here two weeks ago, I talked about a friend that I had ghosted. I had talked about a friend that I pushed away because I didn't want to be vulnerable. I didn't want to take the risk. I wasn't having enough solitude time for God to really check my heart, and I intentionally rejected them. Like, we all do this. We all push people away. We all experience rejection. And as we talk about it, you got to ask yourself in these moments. Like you guys got to ask yourself questions. Like, when I'm preaching, when Berlin's preaching, Marcus, whoever's up here, you got to ask yourself questions. you got to engage in this with your mind. you got to say, well, then how do we deal with this rejection? How do we deal with it? How do we operate in it? How do we operate it so that we can experience the rejection but not be so jaded and wounded and deeply scarred by it and then we have to ask ourselves how can we avoid rejecting others and the answer is just like Jesus did in this passage you see Jesus knew he was accepted by the father and thus because he was able to be accepted by the father he was able to deal with rejection you see there's moments in the bible where The father looks down on Jesus and says, this is my beloved son who I'm proud of. There are times when God speaks and says, this is the one. See, Jesus knew he was accepted by the father. And remember, Jesus was fully human. He experienced the hurt that we experience. It's not like he just had rejection and was just like, oh, that's fine. Like, I'm the son of God. Like, no, like he experienced it. You can see in the gospels, he cries and he mourns with people. Like, so when he felt rejection, he felt it just like us. But because he was rooted in the father, because he knew the father accepted me. 
accepted him, he could deal with rejection. See, God's acceptance and God's love covered Jesus. So when he experienced rejection from his own hometown, when he experienced rejection right here, he could say, I'm still going to press into them. I'm still going to love them. Jesus knew he was going to get betrayed by his closest loved ones. He knew someone was going to sell him off for 30 shekels of silver. He knew his buddy Peter was going to deny him three times. And then he went to the garden and prayed, God, not my will, but yours. See, in the context of this passage, this Passover, this God, Jesus telling them that, hey, you're going to reject me is all leading up to the crucifixion. Within the next, you know, several hours, like he's going to experience all this betrayal that he just said. And then he's going to go climb on a cross. He's going to go climb on a cross for us. Despite the rejection. And there's something so amazingly profound in that. Like, like I said earlier, if I knew I was going to be rejected by someone, I wouldn't even do life with them. I'd be like, hey, I'm good. I'm out of here. I'm not doing this. But if I knew someone was going to reject me, I would definitely not, I would even less want to serve them that I'd want to sacrifice for them. And see, Jesus could only do that because of the love of the Father. And you know, when we talk about the love of the Father, Paul talks about it in Romans. Paul talks about what it means to be accepted by Christ, what it means to be loved by him. This is what Paul says about the love and acceptance of God. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, you can add in that no amount of rejection will ever make you not accepted by the Father. That is how you deal with rejection. You accept the Father's love for you and you rest in it, knowing that he's always going to accept you. You know, when I gave my heart to my ex, and I got to put this out there too, I ended up rejecting her in the midst of all that too. Like, when we both gave each other's hearts to each other and we both rejected it, God said, I will take both of your broken hearts. When I poured out my hurt and my pain to my brother, God said, I will take that pain and that hurt. When I felt like my time was invaluable with people who were like, I had these meetings with God said, I am here with you always because I will never leave or forsake you. I love you and I accept you. That's how we deal with it. And because he accepts me, I am called to accept others. I'm called to love others in the same way. You know, but, you know, God really spoke to me in this moment when I was preparing for this. And, you know, there's there's this tension with this, though, because... You know, like another question worth asking is, why would we put ourselves in a spot where rejection is inevitable? Like, why wouldn't I take the love of God and the acceptance of God and just hightail it out of there? Why wouldn't I just run? It's a good question when you think about it. Like, you can say God loves me, you can accept it, and you can let it guard and cover you and protect you, and then you can just hightail it out there and go live in the mountains somewhere. Like, you could do that. So you have to ask, why do we do it? And I think the first thing is to ask is, why did Jesus do it? And I told you earlier, even though he was experiencing it, he went and did, went on the cross and died. He went to the crucifixion. You see, Jesus willingly was rejected so that all of us could be accepted. He entered into the rejection of his friends, his peers, his family, his community, so that all of us could experience the acceptance and love of God. Jesus, like, it's so profound to me that he said, hey, I'm going to experience rejection so you can experience acceptance. I'm going to come down in this human form. I'm going to sacrifice my divinity. I'm going to be rejected by the people I created, by the nation of the people that I call to, I'm going to be rejected by people who see me before miracles, who see me raise people from the dead so that you can be accepted, so that you can experience fully the love of the Father. 
That's why Jesus did it. So the question then is, okay, then why do we do it? See, we enter into God's love, to God's acceptance, and we let it cover us so that people can experience the acceptance and, uh, the acceptance and love of God through us. That is this whole call to community. We enter into community because God wants to move through us so that people can experience his love. God uses his word, he uses worship, he uses prayer so that people get to know him, but he also uses people. You know, we all were created in his image. We all have something uniquely in us that is like God because we are his image bearers and he wants us to experience that with other people. He wants us to share that with other people. See, that's the funny thing about community. It's this glorious mess. It's so messy. It takes the risk, the vulnerability, the drama, and it takes rejection. But it's meant to glorify God. Jesus entered into such a messy, messy community. I mean, I don't know about any of you, but I've never been betrayed for 30 shekels of silver. Like no one's ever sold me to the police for some money. No one's ever denied knowing me. And like, I've never like performed miracles or I've never made food from five fish and five loaves and raised people from the dead and then have someone deny me. Like I've done far less. I've never walked on water. Peter walked on water with Jesus and still said, I don't know that guy. And then when he fell into the water, Jesus pulled him up. And that's the guy he said, I don't know. But you see, had Jesus not entered into this community, had Jesus not loved these people, had Jesus not served these people, these people would have never furthered the gospel. Peter, the disciples, they all furthered the gospel because Jesus entered into community with them. Was it a mess? Absolutely. But did it glorify the Father? Even more so. That is why we risk rejection within community. That is why we do our best to accept others and not reject them. We do it because Jesus did it for us in such a way that we will never fully understand. Never. You know, this message has just been, has been really resonating with me, especially during worship. Just to know that God takes the risk with me and God has plenty of times been rejected by me. When I've chosen sin over him, when I've chosen my plans over him, when I've chosen people over him, he still said, I'm right here waiting for you to know that I accept you and that I love you. It's something I will never understand. I will never fathom, but I will do my best to enter into it, to make other people feel accepted because that's what he did with me. You know, in this moment, I just want, all of us to close our eyes and just bow your heads just for a minute. I feel this so incredibly strongly. I felt this during worship, but the Holy Spirit is working. The Holy Spirit is moving. And he's trying to tell each and every one of us something. I promise you he is. I believe that in my utmost being that he is doing something in you all. Just be still. I know for a fact, probably all of us have experienced rejection. Maybe we rejected people. Maybe people have rejected us. Maybe we're just continuously rejecting ourselves. And if you're like me, you've done all three, even at the same time. But no matter where you land in this moment, no matter where it is you need healing, you need that healing so you can press into community so you can press into the purpose and so you can see the love of God that he wants to show you, you need to press into it. So if that's you, if you feel God stirring in you that you need that healing or maybe you need that forgiveness for rejecting others, I just, I want you to raise your hand. Good for you. If you feel like you're alone, you're not. There are plenty of people raising their hand right now who have experienced rejection, who have felt the hurt. Now I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing. I'm gonna ask you to stand up. 
Everyone else, just continue to keep your eyes bowed, your, your head bowed, your eyes closed. You know, if I was sitting in those chairs with you, I'd be standing up with you right now. But I already get to stand because I've experienced it just like you. I've rejected others. I've rejected myself. I've experienced rejection from others. And this is what I know for sure. The Holy Spirit wants to heal you. He wants you to enter into the love and acceptance of God so that it can protect you, so that it can shield you. He wants you to experience this so that you can continue to bless others. You see, God wants you to show his love through you, through others. That's such an amazing thought, but you need the healing. You need the healing so you can enter in again and risk rejection, but you can do it this time covered by the love and acceptance of God. It will always protect you. And those of you who maybe are like on the other end saying, I've rejected a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people understand that you are forgiven. You don't need his forgiveness, it's already done, you have it. All you have to do is be thankful for it and say thank you God and know that he still loves you, that he still accepts you. We're gonna enter into a moment of worship again. But before we do one, I'm gonna pray for all of you. But also there's gonna be people in the back with red badges and they want to pray for you. The Holy Spirit wants to use them for healing. And you know, this is a moment where the Holy Spirit is moving in all of us. So even if you don't have a red badge, but you feel called to go pray, go pray. God wants to use people to show his love. Heavenly Father, this is a heavy room. People have experienced rejection in so many forms. And no matter what that form is, one thing has always been true. You have never rejected them. Jesus, you died on a cross so that they can feel your acceptance and love. Holy Spirit, move in these people. Let them experience your love right now as we worship. Let us just lay every burden, every hurt, every pain at your feet and let us experience your love and acceptance that heals, that covers. Holy Spirit, do only what you can do. Amen.
because I know for a fact there are a lot of you here who don't believe that. Oh, how he loves us. And I know it because I was in your chair once too. In fact, sometimes I still end up in that chair not believing, oh, how he loves me. But he does. So when we sing it this time, I need like, Holy Spirit, let them feel it. Let them experience that. Oh, how you love us, God. Holy Spirit is doing something in this room right now because he needs his children to know that he loves you. He needs you to know that he's never rejected you. On your worst day, in your worst battles of sin, in your worst failures, he's always said, you are my child and I accept you. So when you sing it, sing it knowing that Jesus climbed upon a cross and died for you because he loves you. There is no greater act of love or kindness than that for a man to die on a cross who is God, to die for humans, all because he needs us to know that he loves us and that he cares for us. So let us just sing that a couple more times. He loves us, oh. it out to the greatest measure there could be no greater love than yours and it doesn't change would you help us to receive that love father would you help us to stay in community to commit when it's hard god so that we can learn how to press into your heart more father would you break through barriers of insecurities and pain of hurt. There's no greater surgeon and no greater healer than you, Jesus. You can do it, and we trust you for that. We believe for that tonight, that the places in our hearts that are hurting, that are scarred, that have become hardened, you would soften those places, Father, and that you would do deep work in us. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to do that in this place, in us. As we leave here, would you continue to do that? Help us to continue to press in throughout the week. Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you that it's here, that it's abundant. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. It's so great to hear that word tonight. That was so refreshing. I know that I received from it for sure. Um, if you guys need prayer, there's still plenty of uh, people in the back and people on the sides that can pray for you. Not, you're free to go and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for hanging out with us.